From New York, this is Democracy Now! And someday when we do finish that long journey towards freedom, when we do form a more perfect union, whether it's years from now or decades or even if it takes another two centuries, John Lewis will be a founding father of that fuller, fairer, better America. President Barack Obama eulogizes civil rights icon, 17-term Congress member John Lewis at the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. We'll also play remarks of the senior pastor, Raphael Warnock, and the Reverend James Lawson. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once described Lawson as the leading theorist and strategist of nonviolence in the world. We will not be quiet. As long as our nation continues to be the most violent culture in the history of humankind. We will not be quiet as long as our economy is shaped not by freedom, but by plantation capitalism that continues to cause domination and control rather than access and liberty and equality for all. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The daily U.S. death toll from COVID-19 continues to climb, with over 1,000 deaths reported nationwide Thursday for the fourth day in a row. Florida recorded a new record death toll for the third straight day, with 253 new deaths. Even as the outbreak flared to a new record high, officials in Miami-Dade County suspended all drive through and walk-in COVID-19 testing until next Tuesday as tropical storm Isaisis strengthened into a hurricane over the Caribbean and barreled towards southern Florida. COVID-19 is now on track to become the third leading cause of death in the United States this year, after heart disease and cancer. In Chicago, 28-year-old COVID-19 survivor Myra Ramirez spoke to reporters Thursday after recovering from a double lung transplant at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. I think that I definitely have a purpose, and if that purpose is just simply telling my story to um, raise awareness for people to, you know, stay safe and take this condition seriously. The U.S. economy suffered the largest three-month collapse in its history during the second quarter of 2020, with the coronavirus crisis causing the equivalent of a 33 percent drop in annual economic output. The grim report from the Commerce Department came as lawmakers failed to agree to a new round of coronavirus stimulus spending. Enhanced unemployment benefits of $600 have now ended, as has a four-month federal moratorium on evictions. As rent comes due. Housing activists across the country are demanding local protections against evictions during the pandemic. In New Orleans, members of the Renters' Rights Assembly Thursday surrounded a courthouse that handles evictions, chaining themselves together under a banner reading, Evictions Equal Death and blocking several landlords from entering the building. A similar action in Missouri Thursday also brought proceedings to a halt at a Kansas City eviction court. In Brazil, First Lady Michele Bolsonaro has tested positive for COVID-19, days after her husband, the far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, said he'd recovered from the disease after testing positive three times. Brazil has recorded more than 91,000 coronavirus deaths, second only to the United States. Spain recorded its biggest jump in daily coronavirus cases since ending a three-month lockdown in June. Polish officials have imposed new restrictions on foreign travelers after Poland saw its biggest single-day spike in infections. Several French cities have announced new public health measures amidst a new surge in coronavirus infections. Meanwhile, in Greece, Doctors Without Borders says it was forced by local officials to close a COVID-19 center on the island of Lesbos, where more than 15,000 refugees are living in overcrowded and unhygienic conditions. Back in the United States, President Trump's facing bipartisan outrage after suggesting delaying the November election. Trump floated the idea Thursday morning at a time when nearly all polls project he'll lose against Joe Biden in November. Trump tweeted, quote, with universal mail-in voting, not absentee voting, which is good. 2020 will be the most inaccurate and fraudulent election in history. It will be a great embarrassment to the USA. Delay the election until people can properly, securely and safely vote. 
Trump tweeted. Voting experts say there's no evidence to back up Trump's claim. Five states already conduct voting almost entirely by mail, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Washington and Utah. The president also does not have the constitutional power to postpone an election. Only Congress does. However, during a congressional hearing Thursday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo claimed the Justice Department can make that determination. Pompeo was questioned by Democratic Senator Tim Kaine. Can a president delay a presidential election? Senator, the, 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 and, the, and the Department of Justice, others, will, will make that legal determination. We, we all should want, I know you do too, Senator Kane, we want to make sure we have a, an election that everyone is confident in. That's not only for you. Are you, are you indifferent to the date of the election? It should happen lawfully. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Even many Trump supporters have condemned the president's call to delay the election. Stephen Calabresi of the arch-conservative Federalist Society wrote in a New York Times op-ed, quote, This latest tweet is fascistic and is itself grounds for the president's immediate impeachment again by the House of Representatives and his removal from office by the Senate, unquote. The attack on mail-in voting comes at a time when the Trump administration is facing accusations it's sabotaging the Postal Service under the newly installed Postmaster General Louis DeJoy, a former Trump fundraiser. Since DeJoy took office, he has instituted a number of cost-cutting measures that have slowed down the delivery of the mail. The Washington Post reports there's now a days-long backlog of mail across the country. In Georgia, family members, lawmakers, dignitaries gathered to honor the life of civil rights legend and congressman John Lewis, who represented Atlanta for more than three decades and became known as the conscience of the Congress. Former Presidents George W. Bush and Bill Clinton spoke, and Barack Obama delivered the eulogy. President Trump was notably absent. After headlines, will play excerpts from John Lewis's funeral service for the rest of the hour. Herman Cain, the former Republican presidential candidate and co-chair of Black Voices for Trump, has died at the age of 74 after a month-long battle with COVID-19. Cain's last public appearance came on June 20th, when he tweeted a photo of himself at the Trump rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Cain wore no mask at the event, which featured thousands of people packed tightly together. He tested positive for the coronavirus 11 days after Trump's rally, where campaign officials discouraged mask use and were filmed removing social distancing stickers inside the arena. Kane was the former CEO of Godfather's Pizza and a cancer survivor. In 2012, he was briefly the frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination, but later withdrew from that year's race after three women accused him of sexual harassment. In climate news, a record-shattering heat wave has settled over the Middle East, with temperatures soaring across Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia and Syria. Baghdad recorded a high of more than 125 degrees Fahrenheit Tuesday, the highest temperature ever recorded in Iraq's capital city. Meanwhile, a months-long Arctic heat wave in Siberia has spread to Norway and northern Canada, melting permafrost, sparking wildfires and bringing Arctic sea ice extent to a historic historic low. In Bangladesh, scores of people are dead, nearly a million homes flooded, and almost five million people displaced after torrential monsoon rains left nearly a third of the country underwater. New research published in Scientific Reports finds coastal flooding exacerbated by the climate crisis may damage assets worth up to $14.2 trillion by the end of the century. In news from the occupied West Bank, the general coordinator of the Palestinian BDS, that's Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions National Committee, was detained Thursday after Israeli forces raided his home in Ramallah at 3 in the morning. Mahmoud Nawaja was handcuffed and blindfolded in front of his wife and three young children. BDS movement co-founder Omar Barghouti said the arrest is part of an Israeli campaign to, quote, terrorize Palestinian BDS activists and their families, unquote. The Washington Post has revealed the Department of Homeland Security has compiled intelligence reports on two American journalists who published leaked unclassified documents related to the agency's tactics to repress protesters in Portland, Oregon. The targeted journalists were Mike Baker of The New York Times and Benjamin Wittes of the blog Lawfare.
In Chicago, Immigration and Customs Enforcement is being flooded by fake applications for the agency's so-called Citizens Academy, a six-week program where ICE plans to teach attendees defense tactics and firearms familiarization to arrest undocumented people. The protest was organized by the Jewish organization Never Again Action. Immigration activists have been sounding the alarm over the initiative, which ICE hopes to expand nationwide. This is Liz Castillo, an organizer with Detention Watch Network. At best, this school will serve as yet another mechanism for the Chicago Icefield Office to attempt to cover the harm it perpetuates every day. At its worst, this program, which includes training in defensive tactics, firearms familiarization, and targeted arrests, carries with it a lot of potential to foment racial profiling and violent vigilantism towards Black people and other people of color. In Aravaca, Arizona, Border Patrol agents raided a humanitarian aid camp run by the group No More Deaths Thursday. One person was detained. The camp, located some 10 miles from the border with Mexico, is used to provide water, food and medical attention to refugees crossing into the U.S. through the Sonoran Desert, where temperatures continue to rise above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The raid came one day after No More Deaths published documents revealing the Border Patrol Union, a pro-Trump and anti-immigrant extremist group, had in instigated a June 2017 raid of the same camp, calling in support from BORTAC, the Border Patrol Special Operations Unit, the same unit that was recently deployed to Portland, Oregon, to suppress protesters. A New York judge has unsealed 2,000 documents from a 2015 civil lawsuit filed against Ghislaine Maxwell, the British socialite who's accused of luring girls to be sexually abused by convicted predator and sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. In the documents, one victim, Virginia Jufri, says, quote, Ghislaine Maxwell brought me into the sex trafficking industry. She's the one who abused me on a regular basis. She's the one that procured me, told me what to do, trained me as a sex slave, abused me physically, abused me mentally, she said. Elaine Maxwell was arrested earlier this month. Epstein died in prison last year. And in Washington, D.C., human rights groups held a drive through birthday celebration outside the embassy of Saudi Arabia Thursday in honor of the political prisoner and women's rights activist Lujain al Haflu. She was arrested in May of 2018 after leading a movement to lift a ban on female drivers and to overhaul the male guardianship system in Saudi Arabia. Ahead of Thursday's protest, al Haflu's sister Lina published this message. Hi, everyone. My name is Lina. I'm Lujain and Hadlul's sister. Lujain's a Saudi activist who's been in prison for more than two years now. And worse than this, she has not given any sign for almost two months. She's going to spend her 31st birthday in prison. And so, Lujain, wherever you are, I wish you a happy birthday. I wish you freedom. I love you, and I won't let you down, I promise. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Family members, lawmakers, three living former U.S. presidents gathered in Atlanta, Georgia, Thursday to honor the life of civil rights legend 17-term Congress member John Lewis, who represented the city of Atlanta for more than three decades and was known as the conscience of Congress. John Lewis died July 17th at the age of 80. Thursday's service marked the end of a homegoing journey that began over the weekend in Troy, Alabama, where he was born, carried his body onward to Selma over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and Washington, D.C., then to Atlanta. Former Presidents George W. Bush and Bill Clinton each spoke at the service, and remarks from Jimmy Carter, who doesn't travel due to coronavirus, were read aloud. President Barack Obama delivered the eulogy. President Donald Trump was notably absent. Interestingly, John Lewis boycotted both Donald Trump and George W. Bush's inaugurations and was an early outspoken critic of the Iraq War. The funeral took place at the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, once led by Martin Luther King Jr. and his father. Dr. King nicknamed John Lewis the boy from Troy when they first met in Montgomery in 1958. In a minute, we'll hear the words of President Obama and civil rights legend Reverend James Lawson. But first, Reverend Raphael Warnock gave the opening remarks as he presided over the funeral. We praise God for John Lewis. And as we gather in this house of God, we are reminded that as a, te as a teenager, he actually wrestled with a call to ministry. A farm boy, he used to preach to the chickens. I guess you have to start somewhere. 
and at age 16, he preached what we Baptists call his trial sermon in a little country church. But as his life took shape, instead of preaching sermons, he became one. He became a living, walking sermon about truth-telling and justice-making in the earth. He loved America until America learned how to love him back. We celebrate John Lewis. At a time that there is so much going on in our world, the news cycle is packed and moves at a dizzying space, pace. Yet for the last several days, it is as if time stood still while a nation takes its time to remember him. And I rise simply to ask, in this call to celebration, what is it that has summoned us here? and caused us to slow down, to linger for a little while with so much swirling around us. We're summoned here because in a moment when there are some in high office who are much better at division than vision, who cannot lead us so they seek to divide us. In a moment when there is so much political cynicism and narcissism that masquerades as patriotism, here lies a true American patriot who risked his life and limb for the hope and the promise of democracy. We celebrate John Lewis. Beaten and battered, but never bitter and always unbowed. On a bridge in Selma, he stared down bigotry and brutality and tyranny and won. How did he do it? The great-great-grandson of slaves, he received a spiritual power born of suffering, a moral audacity that transcended human station and called upon the human law to more closely align itself with the law of love. Howard Thurman said, by some amazing but vastly creative spirituality, the slave undertook the redemption of a religion that the master had profaned in his midst. John Lewis's ancestors met a man named Jesus in the brush harbors of Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi, and John Lewis received that faith and took it with him across that bridge in Selma and every other bridge. We've come to celebrate John Lewis. So let us be clear, when President Lyndon Baines Johnson picked up his pen to sign the voting rights bill into law, what he etched in ink had already been sanctioned by blood, the blood of the martyrs, the blood of Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, two Jews and an African-American who were murdered in Mississippi, the blood of Viola Luiso, the blood of John Lewis. We celebrate John Lewis. He was wounded for America's transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, we are healed. So let's remember him today and let's recommit tomorrow to standing together and fighting together and voting together and standing up on behalf of truth and righteousness together. We'll get through this together. Let's save the soul of our democracy together. Let's worship the Lord. Let's worship the Lord together. Thank God. For John Robert Lewis. Senior Pastor Raphael Warnock of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, he's actually running for the U.S. Senate in November, speaking at Thursday's funeral for John Lewis in Atlanta. You can see our full interview with Warnock earlier this week at our website, democracynow.org. When we come back, we'll hear from the Reverend James Lawson, a civil rights icon himself and former President Barack Obama. Stay with us. Precious 
Jennifer Holliday singing Precious Lord, Take My Hand at John Lewis's funeral on Thursday. This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we bring you highlights from the funeral of Congress member John Lewis, who died July 17th at the age of 80, three living U.S. presidents, lawmakers and activists from around the country gathered in Atlanta to honor Lewis, including the Reverend James Lawson, a civil rights icon himself who helped to train John Lewis in nonviolence when Lewis was a student in Nashville. Lawson is 91 years old. He helped to form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, that John Lewis would go on to lead as chairman. In April 1960, Ella Baker invited Lawson to give the keynote speech at SNCC's founding meeting in Raleigh, North Carolina. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once described Lawson as the leading theorist and strategist of nonviolence in the world. Reverend Lawson addressed mourners gathered at the Ebenezer Baptist Church to remember John Lewis on Thursday. I've read many of the so-called civil rights books of the last 50 or 60 years about the period between 1953 and 1973. Most of the books are wrong about John Lewis. Most of the books are wrong about how John got engaged in the national campaign of 1959-60. This is the 60th year of the sit-in campaign, which swept into every state of the Union, largely manned by students because we recruited students, but put upon the map that the nonviolent struggle begun in Montgomery, Alabama, was not an accident, but as Martin King Jr. called it, Christian love has power that we have never tapped, and if we use it, we can transform not only our own lives, but we will transform the earth in which we live. I count it providential that as I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, dropping out of graduate school, in Nashville came people like Kelly Miller-Smith and Andrew White and Janetta Hayes and Helen Roberts and Dolores Wilkerson and John Lewis, and Diane Nash, C.T. Vivian, Marion Berry, Jim Bevel, Bernard Lafayette, Paulina Knight, Angela Butler. <laughs> How all of us gathered in 1958 and 59 and 60 and 61 and 62 in the same city at the same time, I count as being providential. We did not plan it. <laughs> we were all led there. And when Kelly Miller-Smith and the Nashville Christian Leadership Council met in the fall of 1958, and we determined that if there's to be a second major campaign that will demonstrate the efficacy of satyagraha, of soul force, of love truth, that we would have to do it in Nashville. And so I planned as the strategist and organizer, a four-point Gandhian strategic program to create the campaign. We decided with great fear and anticipation we would desegregate downtown Nashville. No group of black people or other people anywhere in the United States in the 20th century against the rapaciousness of a segregated system ever thought about desegregating downtown, <laughs> tearing down the signs, 
renovating the waiting rooms, taking the immoral signs off of, water, off of drinking fountains. But it was black women who made that decision for us in Nashville. I was scared to death when we made that decision. I knew nothing about how we were going to do this. I had never done it before. But we planned the strategy. John Lewis did not stumble in on that campaign. Kelly Miller Smith, his teacher at ABC, invited John to join the workshops in the fall of 1959 as we prepared ourselves to face violence and to do direct action and to put on the map the issue that the racism and the segregation of the nation had to end. And so in the 60th anniversary of that sit-in campaign, which became the second major campaign of the nonviolent movement of America, those are not my words. John Lewis called what we did between 1953 and 1973 the nonviolent movement of America, not the CRM. I think we need to get the story straight because words are powerful. <laughs> History must be written in such a fashion that it lifts up truly the spirit of the John Lewis's of the world. <laughs> and that's why I've chosen just to say a few words about it. Kelly Miller Smith invited John Lewis. I met a Fisk student who told me about a student from Chicago who wanted to do something about those vicious signs. I said, invite, invite Diane Nash to the workshop in September because we're going to do something about those signs. Uh, I, I pushed this hard. Now, John Lewis had no choice in the matter. You should understand that. Because all the stories we've heard this morning of John becoming a preacher, preaching to the chickens and other sorts of things, becoming ordained as a Baptist minister. Something else was happening to John in those early years. John saw the malignancy of racism in Troy, Alabama. There formed in him a sensibility that he had to do something about it. He did not know what that was, but he was convinced that he was called indeed uh, to, to do whatever he could do, get in good trouble, but stop the horror that so many folk lived through and in, in this country, in that part of the 20th century. John was not alone. Martin King had the same experience as a boy. I had the same experience from age four in the streets of Massillon, Ohio. Matthew McCullough, a pastor whose name you don't know in South Carolina, had the same experience. C.T. Vivian had the same experience. I maintain that many of us had no choice to do what we tried to do primarily because at an early age we recognized the wrong under which we were forced to live, and we swore to God that by God's grace, we would do whatever God called us to do in order to put on the table of the nation's agenda. This must end. Black Lives Matter. And so between 1953 and 1973, we had major campaigns 
year after year, thousands of demonstrations across the nation that supported it. We had folk in the Congress, folk in the White House, uh, folks scattered across the United States who were beginning to formulate what the solutions are for change. The media makes a mistake when John is seen only in relationship to the Voting Rights Bill of 65. However important that is, you must not remember that in the 60s, Lyndon Johnson and the Congress of the United States passed the most advanced legislation on behalf of we, the people of the United States, that was ever passed. Head Start. Billions of dollars for housing. We would not be in the struggle we are today in housing if President Reagan hadn't cut that billions of dollars for housing, where local churches and local nonprofits could build affordable housing in their own communities, being sustained and financed by loans from the federal government. We passed Medicare. We passed anti-poverty programs. Civil Rights Bill 64, 65, voting rights bills. A whole array. John Lewis must be represent must be understood as one of the leaders of the greatest advance of Congress in the White House on behalf of we, the people of the USA. We do not need bipartisan politics if we're going to celebrate the life of John Lewis. We need the Constitution to come alive. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We need the Congress and the presidents to work unfaltering on behalf of every boy and every girl so that every baby born on these shores will have access to the tree of life. That's the only way to honor John Robert Lewis. No other way. Let all of us in this service today, let all the people of the USA determine that we will not be quiet as long as any child dies in the first year of life in the United States. We will not be quiet as long as the largest poverty group in our nation are women and children. We will not be quiet as long as our nation continues to be the most violent culture in the history of humankind. We will not be quiet as long as our economy is shaped not by freedom, but by plantation capitalism that continues to cause domination and control rather than access and liberty and equality for all. The forces of spiritual wickedness are strong in our land because of our history. We have not created them. John Lewis did not create them. We inherited them. But it's our task to see those spiritual forces. I've named them racism, sexism, violence, plantation capitalism. Those poisons still dominate far too many of us in many different ways. John's life was a singular journey from birth <laughs> through the campaigns in the South and through Congress to get us to see that these forces of wickedness must be resisted. Do not let our own hearts drink any of that poison. Instead, drink the truth of the life force if we would honor and celebrate John Lewis's life, let us then 
recommit our souls, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our strength to the continuing journey to dismantle the wrong in our midst and to allow a space for the new earth and new heaven to emerge. I close with this poem from Langston Hughes, which is a kind of a sign and symbol of what John Lewis represents and what we too can represent in our continuing journey. Langston Hughes, I dream a world where no human, no other human will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a dream where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black and white and yellow and blue and green and red and brown, whatever your race may be, will share the bounties of the earth and every woman and man and boy and girl is free where wretchedness hangs its head and joy like a pearl attends the need of all humankind a touch of such a world I dream Celebrate life, dream and labor for an Atlanta and Los Angeles and the United States and a world. That is to celebrate the spirit and the heart and the mind and soul of John Lewis and to walk with him through the galaxies seeking equality, liberty, justice, and the beloved community for all. Thank you. That's civil rights icon Reverend James Lawson, 91 years old, speaking at the funeral of his friend and civil rights ally, Congressmember John Lewis. When we come back, former President Obama eulogizes John Lewis. Stay with us. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer. Kathleen Bertrand singing If I Can Help Somebody at John Lewis's funeral Thursday. This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Family members and lawmakers and three former U.S. presidents, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush and Barack Obama, gathered in Atlanta, Georgia, Thursday, the Ebenezer Baptist Church, the spiritual home of Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., to honor the life of civil rights legend, Congress member John Lewis. He was eulogized by former President Barack Obama, who spoke hours after President Trump tweeted he's floating the idea of delaying the election. John always said he, he always saw the best in us. And he never gave up and never stopped speaking out because he saw the best in us. He believed in us even when we didn't believe in ourselves. And as a congressman, he didn't arrest. He kept getting himself arrested. As an old man, he didn't sit out any fight, sat in all night long on the floor of the United States Capitol. I know his staff was stressed. <laughs> but the testing of his faith produced perseverance. He knew 
that the march is not over, that the race is not yet won, that we have not yet reached that blessed destination where we are judged by the content of our character. He knew from his own life that progress is fragile, that we have to be vigilant against the dark occurrence of this country's history, of our own history, with their whirlpools of violence and hatred and despair that can always rise again. Bull Connor may be gone, but today we witness with our own eyes police officers kneeling on the necks of black Americans. George Wallace may be gone, but we can witness our federal government sending agents to use tear gas and batons against peaceful demonstrators. We may no longer have to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar in order to cast a ballot. But even as we sit here, there are those in power who are doing their darndest to discourage people from voting by closing polling locations and targeting minorities and students with restrictive ID laws and attacking our voting rights with surgical precision, even undermining the Postal Service in the run-up to an election that's going to be dependent on mail-in ballots so people don't get sick. Now, I know this is a celebration of John's life. There are some who might say we shouldn't dwell on such things. But that's why I'm talking about it. John Lewis devoted his time on this earth fighting the very attacks on democracy and what's best in America that we're, we're seeing circulate right now. He knew that every single one of us has a God-given power and that the fate of this democracy depends on how we use it, that democracy isn't automatic. It has to be nurtured. It has to be tended to. We have to work at it. It's hard. And so he knew that it depends on whether we summon a measure, just a measure of John's moral courage to question what's right and what's wrong and call things as they are. He said that as long as he had a breath in his body, he would do everything he could to preserve this democracy. And as long as we have breath in our bodies, we have to continue his cause. If we want our children to grow up in a democracy, not just with elections, but a true democracy, a representative democracy, and a big-hearted, tolerant, vibrant, inclusive America of perpetual self-creation, then we're going to have to be more like John. We don't have to do all the things he had to do because he did them for us. But we got to do something. As the Lord instructed Paul, do not be afraid. Go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. It's just everybody's got to come out and vote. We got, we got all those people in the city, but they can't do nothing. 
Like John, we've got to keep getting into that good trouble. He knew that nonviolent protest is patriotic, a way to raise public awareness and put a spotlight on injustice and make the powers that be uncomfortable. Like John, we don't have to choose between protests and politics. It's not an either-or situation. It's a both-and situation. We have to engage in protests where that's effective, but we also have to translate our passion and our causes into laws, inst institutional practices. That's why John ran for Congress 34 years ago. Like John, we've got to fight even harder for the most powerful tool that we have, which is the right to vote. The Voting Rights Act is one of the crowning achievements of our democracy. That's why John crossed that bridge. That's why he spilled his blood. And by the way, it was the result of Democratic and Republican efforts. President Bush, who spoke here earlier, and his father, signed its renewal when they were in office. <laughs> President Clinton didn't have to because it was the law when he arrived, so instead he made a law to make it easier for people to register to vote. But once the Supreme Court weakened the Voting Rights Act, some state legislators unleashed a flood of laws designed specifically to make voting harder, especially, by the way, state legislators where there's a lot of minority turnout and population growth. That's not necessarily a mystery or an accident. It was an attack on what John fought for. It was an attack on our democratic freedoms. And we should treat it as such. If politicians want to honor John, and, and, and I'm so grateful for the legacy and work of all the congressional leaders who are here, but th th there's a better way than a statement calling him a hero. You want to honor John? Let's honor him by revitalizing the law that he was willing to die for. And by the way, naming it the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, that is a fine tribute. But John wouldn't want us to stop there, just trying to get back to where we already were. Once we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, we should keep marching to make it even better by making sure every American is automatically registered to vote, including former inmates who've earned their second chance. by adding polling places and expanding early voting and making Election Day a national holiday. So if you are somebody who's working in a factory or you're a single mom who's got to go to her job and doesn't get time off, you can still cast your ballot. by guaranteeing that every American citizen has equal representation in our government, including the American citizens who live in Washington, D.C. and in Puerto Rico. They're Americans. By ending some of the partisan gerrymandering so that all voters have the power to choose their politicians, not the other way around.
And if all this takes eliminating the filibuster, another Jim Crow relic, in order to secure the God-given rights of every American, then that's what we should do. Now, even if we do all this, even if every bogus voter suppression law is struck off the books today, we've got to be honest with ourselves that too many of us choose not to exercise the franchise. Too many of our citizens believe their vote won't make a difference, or they buy into the cynicism that, by the way, is the central strategy of voter suppression, to make you discouraged, to stop believing in your own power. So we're also going to have to remember what John said. If you don't do everything you can do to change things, then they will remain the same. You only pass this way once. You have to give it all you have. As long as young people are protesting in the streets, hoping real change takes hold, I'm hopeful, but we can't casually abandon them at the ballot box. Not when few elections have been as urgent on so many levels as this one. We can't treat voting as an errand to run if we have some time. We have to treat it as the most important action we can take on behalf of democracy. And like John, we have to give it all we have. I was proud that John Lewis was a friend of mine. I met him when I was in law school. He came to speak. And I went up and I said, Mr. Lewis, you are one of my heroes. What inspired me more than anything as a young man was to see what you and Reverend Lawson, Bob Moses, and Diane Nash, and others did. And he got that kind of, all shucks, thank you very much. <laughs> Next time I saw him, I'd been elected to the United States Senate. And I told him, John, you, I'm here because of you. And on Inauguration Day in 2008, 2009, um, he was one of the first people I greeted and hugged on that stand. And I told him, this is your day, too. He was a good and kind and gentle man. And he believed in us, even when we don't believe in ourselves. And it's fitting that the last time John and I shared a public forum was on Zoom. And I'm pretty sure neither he nor I set up the Zoom call because we didn't know how to work it. There's a virtual town hall with a gathering of young activists who had been helping to lead this summer's demonstrations in the wake of George Floyd's, uh, George Floyd's death. And afterwards, I spoke to John privately, and he could not have been prouder to see this new generation of activists standing up for freedom and equality, a new generation that was intent on voting and protecting the right to vote. Uh, in some cases, a new generation running for political office. And I, I told him, all those young people, John, of every race and every religion, from every background and gender and sexual orientation, John, those are your children. They learned from your example, even if they didn't always know it. 
They had understood through him what American citizenship requires, even if they'd only heard about his courage through the history books. By the thousands, faceless, anonymous, relentless young people, black and white, have taken our whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Dr. King said that in the 1960s, and it came true again this summer. We see it outside our windows in big cities and rural towns, in men and women, young and old, straight Americans and LGBTQ Americans, blacks who long for equal treatment and whites who can no longer accept freedom for themselves while witnessing the subjugation of their fellow Americans. We see it in everybody doing the hard work of overcoming complacency, of overcoming our own fears and our own prejudices, our own hatreds. You see it in, in people trying to be better, truer versions of ourselves. And that's what John Lewis teaches us. That's where real courage comes from, not from turning on each other, but by turning towards one another, not by sowing hatred and division, but by spreading love and truth, not by avoiding our responsibilities to create a better America and a better world but by embracing those responsibilities with joy and perseverance and discovering that in our beloved community, we do not walk alone. What a gift John Lewis was. We are all so lucky to have had him walk with us for a while and show us the way. God bless you all. God bless America. God bless this gentle soul who pulled it closer to its promise. Thank you very much. President Barack Obama eulogizing Congressman John Lewis at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Obama then stepped down from the pulpit and donned his face mask as he made his way out. John Lewis's final public appearance was at Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C., a day before he entered the hospital. Lewis died at the age of 80 of pancreatic cancer. In a piece he asked The New York Times to publish on the morning of his funeral, John Lewis wrote, Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process are key. The vote's the most powerful, nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it, because it is not guaranteed you can lose it, John Lewis wrote. To see our interviews with John Lewis, visit democracynow.org. That does it for our show. John Robert Lewis rest in power. I'm Amy Goodman. Stay safe. Wear a mask.